I'm Laurie Hodgson. I'm the library director. I am um, speaking on behalf of the Friends at the moment. And the Friends of the Library are the sponsors of this and 10 other programs during the course of the year that are a wide variety of items and interests for everyone. Now tonight, we have with us Mark Bodanza, who is a, an author. He's, he's a historian, a trial lawyer, a newspaper columnist, and a radio guest. He's written a number of books, including three on sports history, and tonight he's going to share with us um, the story of Jojo White, and that is his latest book that he, he will be sharing with us tonight. So, Mark, thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Lori. It's a great pleasure to be here in Burlington. I love to visit libraries. Um, I'm a library trustee in Lemister, so libraries are near and dear to my heart. Um, and uh, this is a unique opportunity that uh, we all have, me as an author and uh, you as uh, our guest tonight, uh, to have um, me uh, describe this book to you a little bit and some remarks about the uh, great career of Jojo White and to have Mr. White here present to talk to you too. Um, for those of you, I, I would suspect most of you or a good number of you in, in this audience are probably Boston Celtic fans, uh, I hope. <laughs> And, and <laughs> Jojo said you better be. Um, and, you know, a, as Boston Celtic fans, I'm sure you're, of course, aware that, you know, to my, to my left uh, is a uh, Boston Celtic legend. Um, Mr. White uh, played for the Boston Celtics from 1969 through 1978. Uh, during that period of time, he was a seven-time NBA All-Star and a two-time NBA champion. Uh, but that doesn't describe JoJo entirely. There's a lot more uh, to my friend JoJo White uh, than just his basketball career. Um, you know, I, I met JoJo um, in a sort of a unique way, and I remember back when I was 20 years old, uh, this is 1976, I was between my junior and sophomore years in college, and I was painting houses to try to finance my education. And that was uh, June of 1976. Some of you may remember there was a special game at the Boston Garden. And that was in the finals uh, with the Phoenix Suns and the Boston Celtics. And that game is still referred to as the greatest basketball game ever played. And one of the reasons for that is it was a triple overtime game. It was 63 minutes of basketball. And it started on Friday night and ended on Saturday morning. And uh, it was a, a pivotal game in that series. At that point, the series was tied uh, between the two teams. And JoJo White sort of picked up the Celtics and played 60 minutes of that 63-minute basketball game. So f for those of you who are wondering what happened to LeBron with his cramps um, <laughs> last week, uh, think about Mr. White here who uh, played you know, not only a full regulation uh, game of basketball, but most of those triple overtimes as well. Uh, he, he scored 33 that night, uh, made some clutch shots. Um, if there was anybody, if he, they gave him six inches, it, it, was, in the, it was in the hoop. And um, that uh, performance led him to be named the MVP of the uh, finals in 1976. And quite, quite, an honor, quite an honor, of course. And, you know, I was talking to uh, Dave Cowens. One of the benefits of writing this book is I got myself a long list of Boston Celtics past and present with phone numbers and email addresses. And I, I said, well, this is like a kid in a candy store, right? If you're a sports fan. And I, I got a chance to call Dave. And he was one of the uh, Celtics that I called cold. I, I hadn't uh, had anybody call and suggest that, uh, that some young fellow was going to call and ask him about uh, JoJo's career. And at first, he was a little standoffish. And at about uh, two and a half hours into the phone conversation, I said, Dave, my wife's going to kill me. The, the, the supper's on the table. i got to go. I'll have to call you back. Um, but, you know, that was a great, great phone conversation because it, it, he made a simple observation that hadn't occurred to me, uh, even as a Boston Celtic fan over many years, and that is, you know, the Boston Celtics sort of had uh, three eras, if you will. They were the Bill Russell years where you know, the Celtics won 11 championships in 13 years, you know, dramatic domination like no other uh, professional team, uh, you know, before or since. And then there were the bird years, you know, and, you, and during those years, 
you know, basketball sort of um, morphed from a pure sport into entertainment. Uh, TV got involved, and the money went way up. And there were the rivalries, you know, uh, Celtics, Lakers, uh, Bird, Magic. And it was a much more glamorous uh, situation with a lot of, lot of, you know, bright lights and a lot of glare. And in those in-between years fell the Celtics of the 70s, and that was JoJo's era, of course. And the big three of that era, John Havlicek, Dave Cowens, and, and JoJo White. <coughs> And um, they kind of get lost in the shuffle a little bit. It, not, not rightfully so. Because um, when you think about it, and you go back and you look as a fan, their team, 1972, still holds the record for the most wins in a Celtics season, 68. But for a separated shoulder on John Havlicek, they would have had as many championships as the Bird years produced. So they were every bit as significant of a team as you know, uh, Larry Bird and Dennis Johnson and Kevin McHale and Robert Parrish, they just didn't have the same sort of media attention. But that doesn't make it any less um, valuable or any less uh, dramatic as a Celtics fan because that's, the, that's what the Celtics are all about with those sort of humbly determined players that just went out there and played their hearts out. JoJo will tell you a little story about later on that he's fond of telling about some of the instructions he used to get from Red Auerbach as to how to run the Celtics offense. And you'll get a kick out of that when he gets to, to address you. Um, so I had, this was a great privilege to write this book as a fan. Never did I believe in a million years when I was watching that game five in 1976. After I got done painting that afternoon, I went home and took a shower and my buddy and I went down to the local packy and got ourselves a case of Pabst Blue Ribbon. And we went to uh, a friend's house to watch that game, and that's the first basketball game I ever watched and said, whoa, um, dr you know, drama beyond drama. Uh, flash, flash forward, fast forward 34 years, never did I dream that the guy that was leading the Boston Celtics to that win would be sitting in my office someday, and I'd be talking to him um, in a professional relationship. And I, said, I had to tell him, I says, Jojo, this is so incongruous. I would have never in a million years dreamed when I was 20 years old that, you know, I'd be sitting here with you. And he took off his ring from the 76 championship and got a little glint in his eye and handed it to me, put it in the palm of my hand, and I felt all of the weight that that gold physically and symbolically had at that moment. And it was kind of, you know, it was a moment, and we, we bonded over that. So a few months later, I proposed the idea of writing this book. And um, him, he and his dear wife, Debbie, also a great friend, um, liked the idea of it. And uh, I proceeded to start the research. And I thought I was writing a basketball book, but I was wrong. Um, that is not a basketball book. For, don't get nervous for you basketball fans, because there's plenty of basketball in it, but there's plenty more in it, too. Um, it's also a book about the history of our nation and how JoJo's career intersected with that history and in some cases helped change the history of this nation. And it's also, most importantly, a book about a very good and decent person uh, in JoJo White. JoJo White wasn't just a great basketball player. He's a great man. And, you know, I had the occasion of walking into the Boston Garden with him my first time. And we walked out of that tunnel and it was electric. It was, it was during the playoffs, and, and the crowd went crazy. And I had never experienced anything like that. And, and I looked up into the, <clears throat> into the crowd, and there were a lot of young faces, um, too young to have even been born when he was, being, when he was a basketball player. And I'm, I was trying to put this together in my mind. I'm saying, how does he get this kind of ovation from people that never actually saw him play live? And after having been to a number of games with him, I kind of finally put it together. It might be a 200-foot walk from his seats to his car. In every single game, he gets stopped at least a dozen times. Somebody wants to shake his hand. Somebody wants an autograph. Somebody wants a photograph. Somebody wants to tell him a story about where they were in the Boston Garden in June of 1976 or whatever it might be. And, you know, he never says no. He's the most gracious athlete that I've ever witnessed. You know, he's just, he's just a good guy, and he, and he appreciates his fans. He's a humble man, 
and I finally put it all together. That's why people respect him, and that's why people like him. Um, his career started. He, he's from St. Louis, Missouri. JoJo is the youngest of seven children. Comes from a very um, strong Christian background. His father was a Baptist minister. His mother was a good Baptist Baptist mother, and uh, they, you know, towed the line. And you know, JoJo, um, being the youngest, and having to compete with all those older siblings, took to sport um, and loved sport. Um, he'll tell you that he was not only drafted by the Boston Celtics, but this is a Another sort of uh, interesting part of his career, he was also drafted by the Dallas Cowboys and the Cincinnati Reds. So he had his choice to play three major sports. He was good at all of them, but basketball was his first love. <clears throat> when he was on those basketball courts in St. Louis, practicing and honing that classic jump shot of his, um, once in a while he'd come home and his parents would say, Jojo, where you been? You know, you've been out there late. And, you know, they, Jojo would tell him, look, I've been out with him playing basketball at the courts and you know, they heard this story many times, and they were starting to doubt it. And, uh, you know, it become, you know, a little bit of a running issue in the family until uh, they got to watch him play high school basketball for the first time. And then all doubt was erased. They knew where JoJo had been, uh, watching him, you know, absolutely dominate the court. And that, in some ways, means more to him than all of the professional accolades, having his parents come and respect his game and watch him, him hone his craft. And one of the things he, he's, he was taught and one of the things he taught me is that these gifts that he's been given as an athlete and as, as a, you know upstanding man is, is not for him to keep. And he shares them freely with others. And as he says to me, the more I give, the more they come back. I can't get rid of them. And it's so true, and it's a really the essence of life. He ended up playing at Kansas, and that was because of the fact that his coach there, Ted Owens, and the assistant coach, Sam Miranda, were good, decent people as well that convinced his parents of um, the fact that that was going to be a good place for him to, to play because of the type of men that uh, Mr. Owens and Mr. Miranda were. And um, to this day, JoJo has a close relationship. Uh, Sam Miranda has passed away. But JoJo still maintains a close relationship with Ted Owens, uh, who coached, I think, for almost 20 years at Kansas, one of the basketball powerhouses in the country. JoJo was his first recruit, uh, proved to be obviously a, a good choice. Uh, JoJo had several scholarship offers, uh, I believe more than a couple hundred uh, scholarship offers to play around the country. Um, and really early in his college career, a few things came up. Uh, in terms of what was going on with the nation. Um, one of those things was an NCAA tournament. And you might remember, some of you may have seen a movie called Glory Road. Anybody saw that movie before? And it's a, it was a, it's a Disney movie, and it's about a basketball team from Texas called Texas Western. And Texas Western was a team that had mostly African Americans playing on it. And their coach, Don Haskins, uh, was able to guide them to a really... Cinderella type season. They defeated a lot of significant talent out there. And in the regional game, they ended up um, pit against Kansas. And um, JoJo uh, was elevated at midseason from the back then you had to play um, some ju ju junior varsity ball as a freshman. And he was elevated by a vote of the team, despite the fact that some of those team members were going to lose playing time because of his skill. And they elevated him from the freshman team to the varsity team because they had a shot at a national title. In that game, it was tied uh, with only uh, seconds left, about 10, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, Bobby Joe Hill, who was the guard um, for Texas Western, was called for a charge. And the ball went over to Kansas. The ball was inbounded to JoJo, who took it the length of the court and put up a 35-foot jumper from the sideline and fell back into a lady's arms who swung him in jubilation from side to side. <laughs> having, having witnessed that and also witnessed across the court that his whole team had sort of jumped up off of the bench, he was pretty sure the shot went in. Actually, JoJo knew the shot was in, went in when he released it. But <laughs> it, and in fact, the shot did go in. Uh, and you know the, the game was won at the buzzer, except that the referee came down court and called him out of bounds. And, you know, one of the first questions I asked JoJo when I interviewed him was, JoJo, were you in bounds? 
in a very matter-of-fact way, he said yes. And you know what? I absolutely believe him. Now, there's some photographic evidence of this shot, and you can't really conclusively tell whether he was in bounds or, or not from the photos, but what you can tell is the ref had no idea because he wasn't looking at his foot. He was looking down court. So sometimes people see things in their mind, and I'm sure he had good intentions, and, you know, but he called them out of bounds. Go, the game went into overtime, and ultimately Texas Western prevailed. Now, that wasn't so good for JoJo in Kansas, but it was good for basketball because Texas Western went on and ultimately played Kentucky in the finals. They were supposed to lose to Kentucky by 25 points. The head coach of Kentucky at the time was Adolph Rupp, basketball legend, also unfortunately a bigot. And, um, you know, Don Haskins started an all-African-American five, and they went off and won the game, great upset. And next year, basketball was changed, especially in the southern part of the United States. Had JoJo's shot gone in, well, I would hope that the same result would have happened in terms of how you know, people were, were you know, putting these old bigoted ideas away, but that, that kind of speeded things along. Um, two years later, uh, or actually a little more than a year later, uh, Harry Edwards, a, a professor from San Jose State in California, announced a boycott of the Olympics by African-American athletes. And he was joined by Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, a few weeks later, around November of 1967. And of course, this made national news. And there were a lot of um, athletes that didn't participate in the Olympics, most notably uh, a guy named Lou Alcinda. Everybody knows who he is, right? Abdul Jabbar, who became one of the basketball greats. I remember him. You don't remember him? <laughs> How about, do you remember that skyhook, JoJo? <laughs> JoJo will tell you a little bit about that skyhook later on. Um, in any event, um, the U.S. basketball team uh, played some exhibition that summer in Europe. And basketball had become a sport in 1936. Between 1936 and the Olympics in 1964, does anybody have a guess as to how many basketball games the U.S. team lost? Exactly. None. Now, when they went, to, they went to Europe, okay, in the summer of 1968, they played 10 exhibition games. Anybody know how many games they lost over in Europe? Four. They lost two games to Yugoslavia and two games to Russia. This was blasphemy. The pundits, the so-called experts here in America, were predicting that the U.S. team wouldn't even medal. Now, think about that. You, you, you not only won every gold medal from 1936 to 1964, but you never lost a game. And all of a sudden, the experts in your own country are saying, you're not even going to medal. You're not even going to get a bronze. But guess who wasn't in Europe? Jojo White. <laughs> Jojo White was uh, doing some youth uh, basketball instruction in Kansas. Now, when he joined the U.S. Olympic team at the Mexico City Games, they won nine straight in a gold medal. And, um, you know, there was some political issue about that. Should JoJo have observed the boycott or not? But JoJo wanted to play basketball. He wasn't about making political statements. He just wanted to go out there and play the game that he loved so much. And uh, so there are a lot of uh, things in his career. You know, he lived through an era that was unfortunate. I mean, there were games where he had to lay on the floor of the bus because the bus was bricked. Not stoned, bricked. There were games when he entered the arena and the opposing team's cheerleaders were dressed in ape costumes with the name of the black Kansas players on their back. Now, fortunately, we've come some distance in this country. Uh, obviously, some of the things that have been in the news of late suggest that we're not all the way there, but we've made some progress uh, towards those things. These are things that JoJo lived through. Um, in 1969, he was drafted by the Boston Celtics, and even before he was drafted, there was another league back then called the ABA. Some of you may remember them. They had that red, white, and blue ball, and they're the guys that invented the three-point shot. And the other thing they were trying to do is they were trying to get the best college basketball players in the country. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to sign a few of the best players, and JoJo was one of the best players. He was supposed to be drafted at number two, right behind Jabbar. And they, he literally had the opportunity 
of being in a hotel room in Kansas, no agent. He was with his coach, Ted Owens. And in one room was the NBA asking him to sign a contract that said he would not play for the ABA. And the other room was the ABA. <laughs> and, his, and his coach could literally go from room to room until he finally, JoJo only wanted to play in the NBA, but finally signed a contract to play in the NBA. It was so bad uh, between the two leagues that there was a rumor that each league was spying on each other. And, you know, they were painting the offices in New York, the NBA offices, and they were so paranoid about this that they thought that the painters were spies. So they took the painters and they put them in another room and they interrogated them for half an hour to make sure that they weren't spies. Now, later on, the ABA actually did admit that they were spying on the NBA. And one of the players they were interested in getting is, he was truly standing, standing to my left. So it was a very interesting era. Um, he slipped to number nine in the draft because he was drafted by the Army before he was drafted by the Celtics. Um, he, was, he enlisted in the Marine Corps Reserves. Now, you may ask how that happened. How, how does a guy get drafted by the Army? and end up in the Marine Corps Reserves. And what Jojo would tell me, at least initially, was Red is a very powerful guy. <laughs> um, now, what happened is he actually took a, a residency oath at a home in Stamford, Connecticut that happened to be the home of Cal Shear, who was the same guy that signed him to the NBA contract, by the way. Um, and he said Cal had a big house, and Jojo was welcome, his wife were welcome to stay there. Um, so that was the Connecticut residency. He ended up in the, in the Marines. He was the guy that got to carry the flag on the eight-mile run every, every morning and uh, put him in the best shape of his life, which might, might, might give you part of the reason why he was called the Iron Man of basketball. Not only did he play 60 minutes of that 63-minute basketball game, but he set a record by playing 488 straight games. Um, you know, just a really amazing career. Um, you know, JoJo... Um, like I said, you know, not only is he a good basketball player or a great basketball player, but he was, you know, just a, a, a wonderful individual. And in writing this book so many times, I, I've been reminded of that, um, you know, what kind of a guy he is. And, you know, we got fairly deep into the process of writing the book and hadn't had a title. And, you know, one day I went out to his house and he shared with me this scrap of paper. And he said, this piece of paper, my mother wrote this poem years ago, and she gave me this piece of paper. And I've reflected on this nearly every day of my life since I was a young man, since she gave me this poem. And she, he, he said to me, the only person I've ever showed this to besides my wife is now you. And I was quite honored by that, of course. And a little while later, he asked me if we had a title for the book. And if you get to know Jojo, he doesn't ask you for anything. Uh, Jojo is the most uh, gracious person. I remember we got stuck in an airport. We got our flight canceled. The next flight was 12 hours later. And I went back to him, and I have friends. If I told them that, they'd be bouncing off the ceiling. You know what Jojo <laughs> told me? He said, we're in his hands. That's it. You know, no, no griping, no complaining. As it turned out, you know, we, we were able to get a, a, a better connecting flight with some wonderful help and some people. But he's a faithful guy, and a, a lot of it is due to his mother and father. Um, one of you youngsters, can I borrow your book for just a second? I want to read to you. When I, once I got this poem, it was immediately apparent to me that this was going to be the epigraph of the book, and I, I want to share it with you. <laughs> so as like as soon as I can find it. <laughs> there we go. Have you made someone happy or have you made someone sad? What have you done with the day that you had? God gave it to you to do just as you would. Did you do something wicked or did you do something good? Did you hand out a smile or just give out a frown? Did you pick someone up or push someone down? What have you done with your beautiful day? God gave it to you. Don't throw it away. So I said, boy, that, that really says it all in a nutshell. Thank you. And um, I, you know, I, I was driving away from his house that day, and I, I said to myself, you know, the essence of that poem is make it count. Make every day that you have count. And, of course, that's a little bit of a double entendre because 
in basketball, you want to make that shot count too. So I was just getting ready to dial the phone and run this by De Debbie White and JoJo White, and my phone rang, and it was Debbie. And she says, ah, Paul Silas is in a golf tournament with Michael Jordan, and he doesn't golf, and he'd rather talk to you. So I said, well, <laughs> that's a compliment. So um, two and a half hours later with Paul Silas, I got to know him, who's another great man, who, by the way, as a coach of the Charlotte um, Bobcats, I think he told me he was responsible for more NBA marriages than any coach in the history of the NBA. Uh, but we had a nice long chat that day and, and I got to you know listen to some of his reminiscence about JoJo. Um, so it, it, it's really been a, a, an honor to write this book and a, and a great, great pleasure. The book is uh, capable of being read by adolescents as well as adults and enjoyed by both. I highly recommend it for young people. Um, you know, we, we speak at libraries, we speak at schools. Um, I can recall, you know, we had a, a company, we've had a, several companies actually that have been very generous who in one case stepped up to the plate and bought a, a, basket, bought a book for every uh, member of a basketball program in an inner city, inner city school. There were 80 kids on the team. And we went and we spoke to them and we passed out the books and we signed, signed them and we took photographs and had a nice time with them and enjoyed the day. And um, the AD said to me, you know, a lot of these kids don't read. Just want to let you know. And I said, well, hopefully they'll read the book. You know, we'll see what happens. And about a week later, he contacted me. He says, Mark, he said, you know, there are a couple of guys on the team that I know were not readers. And I asked them facetiously a few days after the program whether they had read the book. And they said, Coach, we're halfway through it. And uh, that means more to me than, than any of it, and I'm sure the same for JoJo. You know, um, the ability to touch young people, uh, touch people of all walks of life um, in a humble and a determined way, just the same way he played basketball is really what this is all about. Um, so it's been, a, like I said, a real um, labor of love to do this. And uh, now I'm, I'm honored to, uh, to uh, introduce my friend JoJo White. I don't always take him with me when I... When I, <laughs> I got into more trouble as I'd be, be going from his age on up to 10. My parents thought I was doing everything but what I told her I was doing, playing ball, until they finally got to see one of my games. And my mother was like, I didn't believe you could do that. I, said, I wanted to say no shit, huh? <laughs> But this is for me. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give this away for all the tea in China. I mean, I've been playing sports since I was six years of age. And I still, from that age up to the age that I am at now, explaining to my mother I was in the, in the schoolyard playing <laughs> basketball. And she didn't believe me until one time her and my mother I convinced them to go to one of my games. And they were like, ah, oh, you didn't tell me. You didn't, I invited you, you didn't come. And so ever since then, they never missed one of my games. I wouldn't have it any other way. This here is a, a fan too. And I fell in love with this man um, uh, because we were saying a lot of the same things that made a lot of sense. Uh, in helping to develop young men in sport. Um, I could just stand back and just watch and pass on what he gives these young players that help them be tremendous athletes. <clears throat> I wish I still had some time left on my career. I mean, you got young players out here stealing. I mean, they're paying them great sums of money and they don't have a clue. None. What suffers? The game. But I don't blame the players at all. I mean, if someone gave you $10,000 uh, to play ball, play you that, pay you that much for a year, I may start back changing, playing again. But the game is suffering. 
because we've gotten away from teaching. It's just like raising kids. We've gotten away from those things that are the most important. And we want to turn around and blame everybody else but ourselves. They're our responsibility. It's amazing I get a chance to work with the young guys on the way through. And you have to, because they don't have to listen. I mean, if I pay you eight million, yeah, that's what they do. To get paid that kind of money. And then they don't have to say anything. Coaches, coaches don't have to say anything. They fear for their, you know, jobs. But what suffers is the game. <coughs> Guys who play it don't understand it. Now the rules are different in high school, different in college. You don't have to go but two years in college. And you sign a big, long contract, and you don't have to say anything to anybody. I maintain, if I give someone something, and they can take it out, out there to them and help them be better, I can be in the same place, same spot. They'll come right back to me. Because everything I know, I got it from somebody else. So it's not <laughs> mine to keep. Continue to pass it on for those who are coming on. This little young kid came up to me just this morning. I saw the smile on his face. Somewhere, sometime down the line, I'm going to run into him again. And I hope, I just hope I can pass something on to him to help continue to develop himself as a young athlete. I see the gleam in his eyes. I thank you all for having me here. I, I just get so excited. I played all sports. Can you believe that? All sports. I had to convince my parents that I would play in sports. They swore I was with some young, young girl. <laughs> they were hard to get to. But finally, they came to one of my games. And it was like they couldn't believe what they were seeing. Oh, I was so excited, I couldn't even tell you. Want to take some questions, John? Yeah, I will. Anybody got any questions? Yes. What did it feel like the first time you went on the Celtics court? Uh, I, was, I was honored. You know, because I didn't know, I was waiting uh, to see if I was going to go to the Olympics. 68, I played in the Olympics in uh, Mexico City, won the gold medal. And this was at a time where your best players in college refused to go to the Olympics. So we had to pick up the little slack that Kareem didn't play, uh, Charlie Scott didn't play. There's a lot of players that were top flight uh, players who did not play in the Olympics. You see, and so, but we won the gold medal in, anyway in Mexico City. Oh, yeah. Way back, back in the back here. Sir? In the Boston Garden, which team did you feel was the most uh, challenging when you used to play with the Celtics? I would have to say the New York Knicks. You know, they knew how we played and how we ran the floor and all this thing, just like we knew how they ran the floor. You know, it was like playing against each other. I mean, we gave each other hell. <laughs> jo jo Jojo, like, you, like, you like to run the ball, right? Oh, yeah. tell, tell, tell the audience about what Red told you in terms of running the, running the ball offense. He told me, this was rookie coming in. He said, in front of my teammates, he said, Jojo, I want you to push the ball up as fast as you can up to the other end. And if you get up there, uh, no one's up there with you, shoot it. <laughs> 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 this man had a joint. I mean, what, what? But see, the same thing, when I look back on it, I have to do the same thing to Rondo, who was an up tempo player, who really don't understand how to get his teammates up. You know, and he has the ball. Red told me when you get, when you get it, you push it as hard as you can up the floor. If you get up down there and they're not down there, shoot it. <laughs> so I can shoot it. I always used to scare me, you know. But uh, team is spelled T-E-A-M. There is no I in the word. 
And you have to remember that as you're going through that yeah, development yeah. process, yes. I'm just like, I, uh, I grew up in the 80s and I could see the Celtics, you know, play during the Bird era. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I wasn't alive during the, the 70s. <laughs> and I didn't get to see the 74 and 76 championship Shame games. on you. I, <laughs> I feel deprived, first of all. But second of all, I feel like I, I've read a lot, I've seen a lot of clips of the 76 series. And that was obviously a classic series. But I'm wondering if you talk a little bit about the 74 series with the uh, Milwaukee Bucks. I feel like that's an underappreciated uh, ring and title that the Celtics earned. And I, I don't really know too much about it. If you could share maybe a favorite memory from that series from 74. Well, we, maybe you can talk a little bit about the Big O. Yeah, we, we, we had a great team. And uh, looking back on that team, we were overstuffed with players, you know, who, who not only played the game, but they understood the game. You know, when, you, when you can go off of your turf and go to someone else's turf and spank that net behind, yeah. See, not many players can come to your house and beat you in your own house. You see, but our players feel it doesn't matter what we have to play. You have to come ready to play. You see, when you're going against the opposition. You see, and all the uh, the the Championships we won, we won them on the road. That's the shame you get spanked on the road at your own house. <laughs> Jojo was a big fan of, of Oscar Robinson. Yeah, big old. And of course, Oscar was on that Milwaukee team. And you know, he didn't say two words to him, right, Jojo, when you played against him. But yeah. I have nothing to say. He was one of my heroes growing up, the big old. Awesome player. So in the competition, when we get out on the floor, I don't have nothing to say to him. <laughs> <laughs> the concentration was on. Uh, what was your favorite memory of uh, Red Auerbach? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Red believe in, he'll use the players, you know, uh, current and retired to, to teach ongoing players some of the things that they need to understand this game that they're playing. See, and he didn't mind saying certain things that that you'll look at your teammates and look at Red and say, what the hell is he talking about? And then when you, once you understand it, I mean, he was unbelievable. And I loved him dearly, as close as I would love my father. You got to eat a lot of Chinese food, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Right here? Um, I, I, if I remember correctly, Red wasn't coaching when you play, but it sounds like he was out on the court a lot during practice. He had everything to say, the last thing to say on any team that he was, that he was uh, over. You're right, you're right he wasn't coaching. In fact, first year JoJo played, he, he was coached by Tommy Heinsohn. Tommy Heinsohn didn't know if Bill Russell was going to walk through the door and be the coach until the day the camp started. So Tommy Heinsohn literally didn't know he was the coach until the day of the camp. <laughs> But JoJo will tell you that you know every game almost he met with with Red and there was strategy and JoJo you know in some ways he was coaching the team directly with JoJo. He wanted me to come to his to the front office. This is before the game. Sit there and talk with him for a half hour or more to prepare for the game coming up. Every home game and sometimes them. Oh, you a fag? Why you keep asking me to keep, keep coming to see you? You know, but every every home game, he helped me prepare for the game at, at hand. I mean, he was unbelievable. In my sense. Any questions? questions? Just curious. Uh, I didn't know you played the other sports so well. Uh, you could have been in any of the top three sports. What position did you play in baseball? Uh, George Snap. Oh yeah. Yeah, you hit it, I'm getting it. <laughs> when, he, when, he was, when he was recruited by, tech, uh, by Kansas, Ted told me, he says, I, I couldn't have said it better if I was a movie director. It was a beautiful fall day when they flew, they flew JoJo and his parents out mm -hmm. to the campus, and they were playing football against Oklahoma, who, of course, usually beat them. But that particular day was different because Kansas had a little special player by the name of Gail Sayers, 
<laughs> and Jojo got escorted around campus by Gail Sayers. Uh, Gail desperately wanted Jojo to play play football. Uh, so that was a little special intersection of two careers. It was awesome. What did you do in football? Uh, throw it out there, I get it. It doesn't matter what you throw it, I'll get it. <laughs> Receiver? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That'll make you look real good. <laughs> Tommy Heinsohn told me a couple of years ago that the greatest player in basketball history was Bill Russell. Do you agree? Well, that's his opinion. Well, what's, what's your Bill, Bill was a great, great, great player. Without, without question. What about your opinion? Well, my opinion is the same, but I never got a chance to play, you know, with or against Bill. But I watched him from a distance. And he told me had, had he had known I was as good as I was, he wouldn't have he wouldn't retired. <laughs> I said, if I had known that you were going to retire, you would have never made the back door. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Bill was, he was unbelievable, you know, as, as a player. And his knowledge, knowledgeability about the game. And so, you know, any anyone who had the opportunity of playing with him understood how great of a player he he really was. And what he brought to the game. I think someone in the back. Is yes. Um, <coughs> how did playing with John Havlicek and Dave Cowens improve your game? They were the they were the best that I have played with teammate wise. Havlicek. I mean, John was one of those players he could run the floor all night. And all he wanted for one time, the opposition to take their hands off the, their. Um, Once they were grabbing for their shorts, it was all. Yes, it's all, that's, that's all he needed. Oh, a little tired, huh? And then he'd run you completely out of the gym. <laughs> and he never sweat. No. <laughs> no. Jojo said, I couldn't figure out why the guy never sweat. So I said, John, why didn't you sweat? He goes, you're very simple. I never drank water. Yeah. He was, you know, don't do that, kids, if you listen to that home or otherwise. I mean, he can run back all in, Back in those day. days, that's what they did. Oh. Wow. Man. Yes, a question for you. Get the camera there. Oh, sorry. How did you achieve it as a player? How did you achieve it as a player? Ooh. Uh, finally getting my mother to come and watch me play. <laughs> I mean, I was so proud. They, they were at the game, and my mother, you know, after she did finally get, get a chance to see me play, she was up out of her seat. I mean, like, she was a cheerleader. <laughs> I, mean, this, this, I, I wish I had pictures of this, and I missed them, so. Question. I think the cameraman had a question. <clears throat> yes. Oh, hey, Jojo. Um, it's an honor to uh, hear you talk. Um, do you have any recollections playing with Pete Maravich at all? Oh, yeah. Pistol Pete? Yeah. He was awesome. Yeah, we, we never got a chance to directly play together. Oh, okay. By the time he got to Boston, uh, he had uh, a physical problem as well. Yeah. But Pete was one of the great athletes uh, of our time. And I was like, I was excited about getting the opportunity just to play with him. Because that's how great an athlete he was. Questions? Yes? Would you like to replay any moment in your whole entire career? Which moment would it be? Oh, wow. There's a lot of them. <laughs> I mean, the scariest was when we played in... Uh, Texas Western. Um, Bobby Joe Hill on the other team. Uh, guard, point guard, same position I play. He was an awesome, play, awesome player, you know. But we, as a team, uh, was a scary time when you, you you get up from playing a game, you know, on the road, and <clears throat> the opposition comes up to you and tell you, you better not be in that bus when you come out come out here. And they had guns to shoot off, you know, at a. The bus got ready to take off. We were all laying on the floor. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not my legs were sounding. <laughs> that's not the other team. That's the, the <laughs> crowd. The fans. Question. Yes. yes. Would you be happier if you played during the three-point era, or were you happy playing when you did? 
I was happy playing when I did. I mean, right now, it's a lot of things are taken away from the game itself, you see. Um, in, in, in college, um, players had to go X amount of years before they can go up to the next level. Now you can come out after one year. And you can come out once I pay you, there's nothing to motivate you. And that's what's happening to our game. That's wrong. Oh, absolutely. You see, the game suffers. More questions? Yes. Uh, when the Spurs recently won the championship, they said it was because they played unselfishly. Is that what you think is the most important criterion for winning? One of. You can be, you can be unself, unselfful, but your, your team can't play. <laughs> <laughs> so you're still going to get spanked. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Question. Yes. Growing up as a kid, um, if you could have picked any NBA team to play for, what team would you want? Celtics. Celtics. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I used to watch them when I was in grade school. I was coming on through, yeah. Okay, a couple of questions back, way back. What, what, advice, what, what advice would you give to young athletes and their parents? To work Hard if you if you if you if you working out and working out every day to get better in sport, you have to take it very very serious. You know, because when you're not working, somebody else is, <laughs> and that's your competition. You see. So, and if you need some help, call me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I help you out. Yes, yeah, so man. Um, would you ever consider being a coach for an NBA team? I'm considering it now. <laughs> you know, we're working on, you know, uh, team members and who all is he going to use, you know, to help develop uh, the, the players that are, that are now on the team right now. You know, if we can just say something that can get them riled out to, to really show what you, what you got. But see, right now, you know, you don't have to go but one year college ball, and you can go to the varsity. Well, now if I give you enough money, there's nothing to motivate you. So what suffers? The game. And that's what the game is going through. You got good looking athletes, I'm, not many of them can play. <laughs> you know, they look good. They look good jumping over the rim and all that type of stuff. But it's not helping the game. Much defense, huh, John? No, zero. <laughs> zero. That little girl way back. I see her. Um, who's your favorite player today? Who plays today? Who's your what? favorite player today? My favorite player. Today's today. Ooh. <laughs> it's not. It's not a lot of them. One day one's good. The next day. You know, it's not a lot of consistency, you know, that's happening out there. And we don't have enough of consistency. You know, if you get one good one, uh, it's a long time in between getting the second good one. See. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Do you still have a strong relationship with the front office? I, I will get You do? Yes, ma'am. So you you, get you help Danny out? Yeah, of course, yes, <laughs> yes. You might see me playing. I can still shoot it. <laughs> uh, did you talk about the uh, the impact playing with Don Chaney had on your career in the backcourt? Oh, D. Duck was a defensive player. I mean, he didn't say much. If you didn't know that he was out there, you wouldn't know he was out there because he never said anything. He just worked. I know. I look for him all the time because we were we were very very close. And, and, and D-Duck, we used to call him D-Duck. Uh, he was a defensive player. If you wanted somebody to put some stops on somebody, D-Duck's the man. You know, because he can shut him down. Question. Where, where do you put LeBron in the scale of great players? Back in the, in the, um, um, the shoe room, get some more shoes. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly where I'd put it. I mean, he's an he's outstanding talent.
But see, he's not as talented as 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 they're writing him out there to be. You see, I mean, he's doing his from the perimeter. You see, I mean, the great ones find a way to get in there close, you know, and get those those little cheap shots, <laughs> you know. But um, he still has ways ways to go. Question. Yes. In basketball, were you happy with the position you played, or would you want to be any other position? Oh, I played every position in every sport. Were you happy you ended up as a point guy, though? Oh, yeah. yeah. Quarterback. Yeah, quarter football. I was wide out in, in football. You just throw it in my direction. I, I do the rest. I'll get, I'll get it. I think this young man has a question here. If you were playing, um, Right now. Yeah, if I did play. If you were playing this year, yes. what um what out of all the coaches in the NBA, who would you want to coach you? Ooh. Well it wasn't it wasn't a whole lot of good coaches out there. How about today? Uh, like today's coaches? I'd probably wanna I'd I'd love to still be, be um coached by Tommy Heinsohn, who I completely loved when I had to play under him as a player. Because he stayed right on you. Well, out of today's coaches. <laughs> well, a lot of the days, the, the lot, of, lot of the days coaches, I don't even know. Because you see one, one week, and the same second week you see him, it's another coach's name on his back. So you don't know who's going to be out there. Would it be Doc? Doc? Doc. No. No. <laughs> Doc was having a problem coaching himself. <laughs> Question? Hey, I thank you for your attention. We got one more, Joe. Way back, the young lady. What, what did it feel like winning a championship in Boston? It's hard to explain. It, it, you look back at all the, all the hard work you put in individually that goes with the other people that make up your team. So you want to put your arms around those who worked hardest with you to get to where you, you, you got to do. You had a special moment with Havlicek, didn't you? Well, Czech was a he was a special player. He was fantastic. I mean, this, here's a player who could run all day and not sweat. He was scary. <laughs> you know, he, he'd, wait, he'd wait for whoever's guarding him just put your hands on his shorts like this. That's all he's waiting for. Oh, tired, huh? <laughs> 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 Is it hard to balance like schoolwork and basketball? Not if you want to move forward. In fact, they make it real, real easy. But back when, but back when you were in college, you had to go to class. It wasn't like the. I mean, you, you attended classes, you got a degree and a whole bit. No, they had, they had uh, um, coaches that they'd bring in to, to work with the, with the athletes, you know. Especially if you're a great athlete, they're going to make sure that you get good grades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What would you, uh, what do you, would you, if you were coaching Rondo, what would you tell him? I'm wondering, what, what, what's your opinion about Rondo as a player? He's won a championship, win a championship. Um, <clears throat> whatever I tell him, it would be up close. And the one, the one thing is I would let him know that you can seriously find yourself over there on the, on the bench. You know, because sometime he gives it. Sometimes he doesn't. And he's your leader quarterback on the floor. So he has to set the tone for the rest of the guys. And that, it, it, it pushed, back, pushed me back to remember when I said to you when Red, Red told me, you know, uh, push it up as hard as you can. And once you get at the other end, if no one's down there but you, shoot it. See, that got the other guys up and ready to play. And they got Rondo up ready to play. Yes. 
Um, when you were playing in the Olympics, uh, were all the victories that you won, were they easy victories or were they many challenging ones? No, no, it was easy. It may seem, looking back at it after you've gone through it, but it's not easy. You got to work. It's work when you're all playing together. That's when it's easy. But uh, when the team is not working and gelling together, it makes it tough. It makes it tough to win. But see, once you taste what, what it tastes like to win, you don't want anything but that. And so you're willing then to put the kind of work you need to put in to reach those goals. We'll take one more question that young man we got. Um, um, what age did you really become satisfied in basketball? When I was six. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't, I couldn't convince my parents of that. All they knew was their, their uh, lawn was messed up and their toilet basin that we tore up, you know, was, 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 was tied up in the, in the, in the car. Two more questions. You want two more? Okay. Anybody got a question? Cool. Who were some of the players uh, that you played with uh, uh, on the Olympics? When you played in the Olympics. Well, these are players that you, you might not know. Spencer and, well, Charlie, Charlie played with us. With the I remember the name. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the problem with Charlie was getting him to shut up long enough so we can get information to him so we can do what we have to do. Charlie Scott, was a, for those of you who don't know, is a pretty fiery yeah. young player. And um, he, was a, he was with Phoenix before the 76 finals. And ultimately, um, it was, there were some rumors that he was going to be traded to the Celtics, but Bob Ryan of the Boston Globe said that Charlie Scott was as likely to become a Boston Celtic yeah. as Arthur Fiedler. <laughs> and lo and behold, a few weeks later, Charlie Scott was a Boston Celtic. Uh, what Bob Ryan was thinking was that, that he'd never get along with Jojo White. But as it turned out, they're, they're great friends to today. And, you know, um, Jojo was quiet and determined, and Charlie was fiery. They had different personalities. But, you know, um, they jumped. And that's a testament to who Jojo is, is in, in large part. But in, those, in that 76 game, um, when JoJo played 60 minutes of that game, you know, they, they were literally playing, I think it was less than 48 hours later, they were flying across the country and playing in Phoenix. I had to talk with him from Boston to Phoenix all night. I had to talk with him. <laughs> he got him charged up. Because he played the game before at home before he left to fly to Phoenix. He did not score a point. In fact, he got thrown out of the game every game we played. And so I was telling him, I said, Charlie, I am dead tired. <laughs> and you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to step it up. And after we finished talking, I, could, I can even tell you the game he put on the night, the night next. He scored, he scored 22. And, uh, of course, they won the championship in that game. And I was on him the whole time. <laughs> right here. I'm sure you have uh, a lot of great memories of uh, your years with the Celtics. Is there one, one that stands out in your mind? Oh. Because you get, you get something from each game you play. You get something from each member of each game you play. You see, I remember sharing, you know, a moment, you know, that we had with a, with a teammate after the game is over. A big moment that the, 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 the regular member can't see the little things that are the most important out on the floor. Or to understand what you, what you want from one another. I'll take, I'll take a couple. Okay, thanks for your I totally understand some of the, the critical comments that you and the feelings you might have towards a lot of modern day players. Yeah. Um, but I'm really curious what your take was on the Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett era, the five or six year run that the Celtics had from 08 to last year, 13, when KG and Pierce left the team. I, I, just, I wonder if that resonated with, with your style of play and your philosophy on basketball, the way they conducted themselves on the court and off the court. And, well. I got a chance to talk to talk with both of them, and believe me, 
They hated that they made the decision that they made. Because he, he, he's part of the Celtic body. You know, it came at a time where they they fit with that, with that organization. But then you get cut off. You, get, you start thinking in terms of dollars and cents. And you forget about, you forget about what makes you a team. And it takes all, all five, all six, all seven of those guys. You know, bringing it together all every night. Yeah, they have to agree, agree. And they didn't find that out, how important those guys were to one another until they started getting moved to other teams. It was like, well, it's too damn late then, no? Paul, Paul's also a Kansas alum. Yeah, right. And so they have, a, they have a special bond in that, in that moment. I'm going to have to get you to write your stuff down. Do you, do you think you deserve more championships? Then you actually won? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we were kicking people's behind on a daily basis. It wasn't, you know, we win and then, then you take off two years. Now, every year we showed up, you better bring something because we are. Mm -hmm. See. But let's go wait. If you had the opportunity to write a biography of another player, basketball, who would you pick? Uh, probably Red. I mean, he was, he was unbelievable. I mean, it's like he knew what to say, when to say it, without rehearsing. I mean, it just comes automatically, just like that. And he knew what to say, you know, to motivate players, you know, uh, to get them focused in on their game and on the game, period. Everybody who plays it don't understand it. But this man can teach it. Uh, certain things he'd say to, to reverse everything back on you, like it should be. Team is spelled T-E-A-M. There is no I on the word. And see, with, Rod, with, with, with Red, he made sure that we understood that at, as a team. It makes the game a lot easier when you're playing it together. I can, I can rely on, on, on my teammate. He can rely on me. But see, out there now, it's a whole different, it's a whole different beast out there. All right, we're going to sign some Still a very, very handsome man. I know. I mean. <laughs> See, she knows. <laughs> he was so knowledgeable. He knew, he, knew, he knew what to say, when to say, and how to say. Oh, I know. Yeah. yeah. It's June 19th, Thursday night here at the Burlington Public Library, and the place was packed for Jojo White and Mark Bodanza. Hello, guys. Hey, how are you? How are you? I'm great. I'm, I'm with Jojo White and Mark Bodanza. I mean, yeah. fun, too. <laughs> Our show is on live on Thursday nights, but they are constructing a new TV station in Winchester. So, and then you're here, so it was just serendipity. Mm -hmm. There you go. But th what an attentive crowd. They had some great questions, didn't they? They did. I was, I was excited. The fact that uh, they were as deep into uh, learning more about the Celtics organization as we are. One of the librarians noted to me that some of the young kids were really uh, well-versed on basketball. 
I, I, yeah, not only were they well versed, but they were very poised. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, you know, they answered, they asked their questions with a great deal of uh, confidence, and uh, it was really nice to see. Absolutely. Now, is there a book tour going on? Did you start a book tour, or is this? We, uh, we have actually traveled everywhere from Iowa to Florida to and in between. Um, you know, we do libraries frequently. We do schools, and uh, we, we just enjoy it. So it's a so, you know, we get out once in a while, Jojo and I, and we'll you know like to meet the fans, and it's it's uh, it's really an honor to uh, for us to you know uh, hear all these great stories and listen to people's uh, interest and love for the Celtics as uh, we share together. Now, when you're out on the road, do you get ideas for maybe another book from all these people? Oh, uh, <laughs> as we go, we you know um, uh, interest comes. It all depends on how the different franchises continue to work, how they're developing other young players then uh, we can talk about that. Now, when did you come up with the idea for the book? I think we started the book in uh, 2011, um, probably around summer of 2011. The book was uh, published in um, June, I believe, of 2012. Okay. Yeah, it took about a year to, to research and write it. And Jojo, how did you meet Mark? Uh, being a basketball player, you know, uh, when you when you reach someone who has uh, uh, taught the game, football, uh, been around basketball, you know he has a lot of uh, things that he can pay on pay off to uh, even the current players. And he doesn't even play basketball, <laughs> but uh, he's very ta uh, uh, knowledgeable in the game of sport. Period. And that's how you guys met through. Yeah, we, you know, yeah, we we had, we met, and uh, I was I was you know obviously excited to meet JoJo as well. Um, Hacking back to those uh, years in um, 1976, especially watching that triple overtime mm -hmm. game. I mean, you know, never did I dream someday I'd be writing his book 34 <laughs> years later. Uh, but it's been it's been a real honor and pleasure not only to write his book, but you know to become friends. And uh, we have similar values and ideals, and JoJo has taught me a lot. I mean, part of it is is that you know he was uh, raised in a in, in a very fundamental way where you give back and you know you're, you're humble, and um, his parents imparted some wonderful values to him, and it, it uh, shows not only just on the basketball court but off the court as well. Now you've had a long night, so I'm not going to keep you on the hot seat long. I'm going to ask JoJo. I know you've had a lot of success when the book came in and you opened it up. What were your first thoughts? Um, it's, it's not something I haven't heard, you know. So it, it, I wasn't shocked with, with what we talked about. I wasn't shocked with what we presented. Because we were, I mean, since, since I've been with the Celtics, I mean, I learn something every day, you know, and, and open to continue to learn and pass that, that on. Uh, so it's still exciting to me. Do you think you'll put it in other languages? Is there a lot of interest for the Celtics around the world? You know, we, we actually did a t uh, television interview at, on the Boston Common with a uh, Globo TV from Brazil, uh -huh. which is actually the fourth largest network in the world. I, honest to God, I don't know where. The guy was wonderful, came up from New York, did a nice job with it. I don't know what, what they did with it. I assume they had to translate it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, there, there, are, there is interest in, yeah. in other countries, whether the book will ever be translated, who knows. But... Um, we we enjoy it because the book is a book that can be read by an adolescent or an adult, enjoyed by both, and you know everybody can take something out of it. Not just about the heritage and wonderful times of the Boston Celtics in those years, but also about life in general. Mm -hmm. And Jojo's a great role model for Absolutely. the kids, yeah. and we appreciate that. Thank you so very much. Yeah. And the final thing I'm going to ask: Could you say this is Jojo White on Visual Radio, and then I'm going to ask Mark for a station ID too. This is Jojo White on Visual Radio. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> and, and with him, Mark Bedanza on Visual Radio. It was a pleasure to do this interview, Joe. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming out to Burlington. All right. Thank you. Good luck with the book. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay LaFond and Haverhill TV. Thank you to BCAT here in Burlington. And thank, to Win thank you, WinCam in Winchester.